you know, when she sent me her bio, I could see what she meant. She has worked in a lot of different areas in professional psychology over the years. In fact, she is uh, the fellow of no less than seven ABA divisions, or maybe it's eight now, the last time, but who knows. Uh, she's board certified in clinical, family, and forensic psychology. Uh, she has traveled uh, all over the world. That was the other thing that, that uh, impressed me. She, she uh, includes a list of all the places where she's gone and uh, uh, lectured and done workshops uh, alphabetically. And uh, we don't have time, you know, it would take up half our time if I went through the whole list. But uh, if you think of a country, she has probably uh, been here. Iceland, yep. Iceland is <laughs> one of the places, yep. Um, Czech Republic, yep, yeah, she's been there too, a lot of other places as well. Uh, she's now a distinguished visiting professor of psychology at the Florida Institute of Technology and has also uh, taught at a number of other places such as the Harvard Medical School and uh, Duke uh, University Medical Center. She served as the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Marital and Family Therapy uh, and served on a lot of other editorial boards. Uh, has edited, authored, or co-authored 31 books, contributed chapters to over 60 others, and published over 190 articles in professional journals. And her most recent book, which is actually very recent, just off, hot off the presses, um, and I think you have some copies here that, that people are interested in buying one, Divorced Fathers and Their Families, Legal, Economic, and Emotional Economic. And last but certainly not least, in 2008, she received the American Psychological Foundation Gold Medal Award for Life Achievement in the Practice of Psychology. Those of us who are uh, part of APA you know that, that's the big. So I'm really delighted that uh, Florence has found time in her busy schedule to come here to Gazap, manage New Jersey Transit, which is another accomplishment. You can ask your, your list of accomplishments and got here on time to uh, talk to us about intervention prior to oh, I need to put this on. There we go. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Chernis. What, what uh, he didn't mention and I thank you for not mentioning it. Well, I, I, I will. <laughs> um, especially when I'm talking about family, and my husband's here with me. As some of you may know, there is another Dr. Caslow, and this is a, a part of the interview you didn't get. Uh, my daughter, Nadine, is now president-elect of APA. So we're really an, an APA and a psychology family on the female side. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and my granddaughter is a graduate, a, an undergrad student, so we think we have the female psychology gene. Uh, my husband and son uh, are both financial consultants, and they shared an office. And one of my other fields is family business consultation. So I have not written about divorce because I've been much divorced. <laughs> uh, we're very much an intact family. Okay, um, my technical skills aren't great. I hope that I can get this to, to show the slides. You may have to help me. All right, uh, one of the things I'll be working from. What did you do? Just the back. Um, over the years, I've developed, um, using some other people's work but elaborating it, a model of the stages of divorce. It's important not to think about divorce as a unitary process. And when you think about divorce, the stages are not totally sequential, although I have um, set them up that way for purposes of understanding. They do overlap, they run together, people go back and forth. The second thing is, each person in the nuclear family and in the extended family goes through the divorce process differently. So try to keep in mind, as I talk about this, the family of safe foods. 
of parents in their 30s or 40s, and one child in latency, and one adolescent, plus grandparents on both sides. All of them are affected. However, if you have a family that's a little bit older and there are uh, close to adult children of divorce or college-age children when the parents are going through divorce, they are all affected. And each person is worrying about different things. So a very young child is thinking about, what if my daddy doesn't live here anymore? And even if half the children in his or her class are children of divorce, when somebody else's daddy doesn't live there, it's very different than when my daddy doesn't live here. And teenage children, the oldest particularly, may be worrying if dad moves out or mom moves out, what happens to the family finances? Will there still be money for, uh, for me to go to college? Or if one of them cracks up or be goes deeper into alcoholism or drug addiction, do I have to stay home or leave college and take care of them? And with the older children, what I've seen very often, uh, those in their 40s and 50s, well, well <laughs> let's see. <laughs> the question then becomes, what if dad remarries? What happens to his will? Does he change it? Will she get everything that was promised to us? And if it's mom who remarries, there goes our babysitter. Grandma's You know, it's very interesting if you see children introducing grandpa's new girlfriend. But think about, grandma has a new boyfriend? That's very strange. So have a sense of how this reshapes the family. This is not in the divorce literature. All right? So, one of the objectives today is for you to understand the stages of divorce and what happens during that. Okay, this is the scales of justice. And throughout, remember, it is an emotional process and a legal process and an economic process. Okay. Um, we won't have time for the ceremony of divorce. Uh, if we get to the last stage, I'll talk about it. You have an article on post-divorce relatedness between parents, their divorced sons, and grandchildren, and you have a bibliography. Um, <coughs> in my first two books on divorce, written over a span of time from uh, 19, early 1980s through the 1990s, primarily emphasized uh, the plight of mothers, the economic change in their circumstances, what happened to children. And then over the years, both in therapy and in my personal life, I heard more and more men, who I very much respected, talking about what happened to them and how unfairly they had been treated under the law, those scales of justice, how many judges favored the women. We did such a good job in the women's movement in saying we want it all, including we want the women to be taken care of, that so many of the men were truly alienated and out of the lives of their children. And if you want to check that out, look at the literature in which it talks about men as deadbeat dads, drunken dads, dads who disappear, and I felt that we had not looked at the dedicated, <coughs> devoted dads. And so the book is based on 13 interviews of the good dads and what happened to them, and is an update in the law 
so that where I come from, Florida, there's been a new law in 210, and I changed my chart today coming here to include some of the new language. Ken, it's totally dropped out. There's no custody. There's no visitation. They talk about child sharing. And it's shifted from a presumption of mother preference, which has been the law in most states over the last 40 years, to a preference for shared and equal custody, which has revolutionized. Now, that's not true in all states. So as you go back out into practice, if you're working with divorced, divorcing and divorced people, in the one of your desk drawers, keep the current law in your state and the revisions, because what I tell you from my state or another state is not applicable. And every time I hear the term, we're into child sharing, it's like we're into condo sharing. <laughs> We have it two weeks of the year and somebody else does. How you share children is very important to them and to you. One of the current arrangements that some people think is new that I worked with in mediation 20 years ago is that the parents move in and out of the apartment and the house and leave the children there. That can work fine, the kids are stable, until one of them has a new partner. The new partner says, this is crazy. I'm not moving out every other week. Besides which, you're still sleeping in the same bed, just in alternate weeks. I don't like that. Okay, so that's some of the kind of overview. All right, now, in the States, pre-divorce is the time of the emotional divorce, of the fragmenting of the relationship. I'm going to try to uh, pick up quickly some of the cultural, ethnic, and racial and religious factors. To the extent that I don't do it, be aware that divorce will vary according to people's religious beliefs. Uh, if they are uh, very observant in any of the religions, more traditional, particularly if it's a religion that says we don't accept divorce, they are not only going against their family, they are going against their religion. The losses are magnified. Um, if they are of a religion like Orthodox Judaism, where um, only the man is allowed to ask for the divorce, then it is much more difficult for the women. You want to be aware of those factors. Um, in the Muslim religion, again, how much of it is permissible within that religion? What is the family structure? Uh, how many people are divorced previously in the family because it's more acceptable in a family in which there have been prior divorces? If, if it's the first divorce in the family, the son or daughter goes home and says, I'm getting a divorce. Oh, no, you're not. Not in our family. So there are different reactions to that. Okay. Um, now, the word I want to emphasize is pain. I've rarely seen anyone go through divorce without experiencing a great deal of pain. It's the pain of loss. It's the feeling of I made a poor choice. I failed, and one of our tasks in any kind of therapy is to help them to um, reframe it not as a failure, but as having changed, having grown, having wanted something very different. Divorce is easier if there are no children. Divorce is easier if it's a short time marriage. Uh, I've heard many people in therapy say, I wish he or she would die, but divorce, no. Death is easier. A former dead spouse doesn't call you on the phone for more child support. You don't run into them at the supermarket or a party unexpectedly. Uh, all of these things keep 
a former divorce spouse alive. All right, much harder. Besides which, a divorce is a choice. Death, you didn't have a choice unless it was homicide. <coughs> okay, we're not going to do that. Um, okay, now if I can get the chart. All right, I'll do it. And if anybody wants this material, <coughs> I will get it to Dr. Chernis, and you're welcome to it. Pre-divorce, a time of deliberation and despair when the when uh, couple realizes, or one of them does, they want out. And let me start with the time when we're young with the children. We're all raised with some kind of a myth or some folklore or fantasy about marriage. And it can be summed up for women in, I can't sing, but someday my prince will come. <laughs> okay? So whether we're Cinderella or Sleeping Beauty, someday my prince will come. And for the prince, even if a wicked witch turns him into some horrible monster, when he meets the princess, her kiss will awaken him and the spell will be broken. And we hear this for so long, the fairy tales that we're raised with in the nursery. And so we all sort of harbor these romantic dreams. But they never tell us how do we live happily ever after. We just ride off into the sunset, whether it's on our white horse, on a white motorcycle, uh, in a white uh, Ferrari, it's always white for purity, all right? And the dreams continue through all generations and across all countries. Now, but that doesn't happen, and we aren't told that uh, that dream may last for several years uh, until reality sets in and the honeymoon, as such, is over, and it's hard work. Now, um, people find their partner is not there to cater to their everything, <coughs> that the partner that they chose, who was supposed to be endowed with the ability to fulfill everything they need, partner, playmate, substitute parent, lover, best friend, couldn't fulfill that. None of us can be everything to anybody. Um, the partner that indulged us, gave us all their time, now wants the night out with the guys again. Or I want to go out with my friends, or I need to work late more evenings. And so this idyllic time begins to come to an end, and our narcissistic needs are no longer fed as totally. As the children come, as uh, the and with many of the two career couples, working, parenting, traveling to and from work, the myriad responsibilities take away from the marital relationship, which goes from the top of the list of what's important to with all the other time demands, it gets lower and lower in terms of time together. If people get to marital therapy early enough, we can talk about. I'll make sure you have a couple of nights after the kids go to sleep when you have time alone together. Make sure you have date night at least once a week. Make sure you remain important to each other, that you have playtime together. Family time is different than couple time, but that doesn't always happen. They neglect it, they take each other for granted. Now, um, the other thing is, many people put their best foot forward when they're going together, when they're living together. Years ago, couples thought that if they lived together and then got married, they would know what they were getting. I'm not sure. The data is just contradicts that. Couples who live together have a higher divorce rate in the early years. Many of them kind of slide into marriage because they feel they should. And uh, many couples that didn't live together think out much more before they finally get married. 
is this really what I want? Because living together and breaking off, if you've lived together for a few years, is much more difficult. So that's not an insurance policy. Anyway, when, uh, when couples realize they're in trouble, very often one or the other says, we need help. Interestingly, the path to a well-trained marital therapist, couples therapist, uh, may be kind of a windy path. Often people go to their clergyman, uh, clergy person is what I should say today, their clergy person. Um, I think if you went to enough bars and enough beauty shops, you would find that the bartender, the nail tech, the beautician, hear all of the marital problems. They're, they don't give advice, but they listen. Some of them may presume to give advice. They may go to either set of the in-laws that they think will be most helpful. Often by the time they come for so-called marital therapy, one wants in, the other wants out. And it's very important if you're doing marital therapy to ask them, what is it that you're here for? Do you both want to keep the marriage going and make it better and invest the work in it? Because if one wants in and one wants out, I can't do what you both want. You have to decide whether I'm doing marital therapy or divorce therapy. Do not let them push you to tell them what to do. It's their life. They have to live with that choice. And so often I'll hear somebody say to me, down the road, our therapist said we should get divorced. <clears throat> well, either they're lying or the therapist did something they probably shouldn't have done. I may say, conversely, you've been here a half a dozen times and all I've heard is how horrible your marriage is. <coughs> Tell me why you're staying married, all right, and see if they come up with enough positive reasons. I may ra raise the question. But that's very different than, I think you should get divorced. It sounds horrible. OK. Now, if one says to the other, in your office or in their own life, I'm done. I want out. By the way, I'm already involved with someone else. If they're already involved, it's that much harder. Right? They may not be planning to marry the fairy. The fairy is what helps them escape from a situation they no longer want to be in. Now, if the marital partner wants to call the affaire and say he or she's not available, that doesn't help. All right. They didn't blindfold them and drag them. They went willingly. All right. Um, so they have to then make a choice. Are they in and working on it? Or are they out? I'm dealing with uh, someone right now, and I've gotten him to the point where you can't have both. You've got to make the choice. And the day that I said that, he stopped coming. This is a year into treatment. All right? He wants both. And until one of the women says, I'm done with this game, but neither of them will say it because they don't want to lose him. So they'd rather share a man than lose a man. And I don't think he's that terrific. Because <laughs> 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 I would never share a man. Who's um, better to do it tonight? Anyway, um, so that's the decision. And many people will play the half married, half playing game for a long time. Now, a partner who feels rejected. Why did this have to happen? There's disillusionment, the dissatisfaction, the disbelief, the anxiety, feelings running rampant. And please be aware from this point on that people need to be rational to engage in the legal process and the economic decisions at a time when they're emotionally all over the place. It's very different, difficult to cope with the emotional side 
at the same time that they're going through the legal way. Okay. They may come into your office one day and be semi-hysterical and really look borderline. And the next time they come in, they're ready to talk about the problem. And they see so. They're not truly borderline. They're not psychotic. They're getting divorced. <laughs> but it looks like those sometimes. You, you all recognize it. Okay. Now, um, the denial, the despair, the can't we try again? Can we go on vacation together? It depends how far it's gone. Some couples, yes. Now, um, trial separations. Can that work? Sometimes. Providing it's time limited and they establish the rules for the time, trial separation. No dating or both can date. But the rules have to be the same for both of them. And it's their rules, not yours. But you have to say, uh, I will have difficulty working with you if you don't abide by the rules you set. Now, I do the same in marital and divorce therapy with secrets. If you tell me secrets, I will try to keep them. My memory is still good. However, it's not infallible. But the rule that you make is up to you. But the same rule applies, uh, applies to both. So if you decide I keep secrets, I keep them for both of you. If you decide I tell secrets or, or I push you to tell them, it applies to both. If you call me on the phone and unexpectedly tell me a secret, I pray by whatever rules you've established. All right. Don't get caught in I never hear a secret. Uh, there have been many marital therapists that say you've got to break all the secrets. I've dealt with enough people that have come from trauma situations all over the world where to force them to tell secrets is really to imperil their lives. So I think there are times people should not tell them and we shouldn't force it. But you're not going to hear that from everybody. So be aware that there's still controversy on that. Okay. Now, uh, at the point at which one decides that the decision for divorce is irrevocable, there's very little the other can do, all right? Uh, and, and I say very little. Now, they can escalate. I've had a couple sit in my office, and the woman said, she, and I didn't realize when her psychiatrist sent her, sent them, that she was an inpatient. And when uh, they came to the office and he said, I mean this, we live separately, the marriage is intolerable to me. She said, go ahead with the divorce. I will call the children tonight, tell them you're pushing for the divorce, and I will say goodbye to them and suicide tomorrow. Mm -hmm. All right? That's an, quite an escalation. And I looked at him and I said, do you believe her? And he said, I'm afraid I do. I said, where do we go from here? He said, I guess I don't go for the divorce. All right? If you have an adolescent who is um, slitting his or her wrists or uh, seriously anorexic or bulimic and they're causing havoc and threatening suicide, I would watch. So again, the extenuating serious circumstances, you may want to help them delay it until the situation is more stable. But that kind of crisis negotiation doesn't happen in most cases. Okay, now, we used to have only um, uh, adversarial divorces, and they tend to be horrible. They take the situation and make it worse. In the late 1970s, when Dr. Kressel and I met each other through divorce mediation, the field of mediation started. Since then, uh, we have added uh, collaborative divorce as well as mediated divorce to litigated divorces. They are much better processes if the people are willing to try to be more civil and more just 
and fair. If it's all about me and I don't care what happens to you, you've walked out on me, I'm going to retaliate and do everything horrible I can to you, then they're going to go to jail. Um, there is also the pro se divorce, where people uh, file the papers on their own, and unless there are no children and they're pretty well in agreement, generally they need to use one of the other processes. Now, stage two is the legal divorce, where they enter into one of the processes. If you're working in this field, you might want to know who are the lawyers in your community, who are the, the uh, what are called the barracudas, the tough litigators. I don't keep that list. Uh, who are the fair litigators, who are the good people in mediation and divorce collaboration. Um, there have been a few cases that I've had where I have people in divorce therapy. They will tell me what lawyers they're, they're using and they are the meanest people in town. And we're a fairly small town, so I know them. And I know that every time they go to court, they're battling each other for power. And it has very little to do with the, uh, the two uh, people and that this is about how much money they can make and how many motions they can file. I need to say to them, if that's who you're using, that's your choice, I'm not a good therapist for you during this process. Because I'm going to tell you different things than they do. You're confused enough. It's not going to work. And I will not stay in the case. Because one time I, I made a comment to someone, you're using one of the toughest lawyers in town. And within two hours he called me and said, the next time you say anything like that about me, I'll see you in the courthouse. I don't need that. That's not the kind of practice I want to go with. Okay. So, um, during the legal divorce, one or the other is likely to engage in a lot of self-pity, desire to retaliate, to feel absolutely helpless. Um, th there's a lot of bargaining, screaming, threatening. Um, now, often you have the two processes going along simultaneously, of the therapy process and a legal process. And all of this is happening while they've got to be tending to the kids, tending to the extended family, working. And it is a horrific time in their life if it's a nasty divorce. So you might be moving from couples therapy to family therapy to individual adult therapy, child therapy for the children, child advocacy if you feel the children need a child advocate. And one of the interesting new things that APA has done is moved into setting up parenting coordination offices around the country. And the new work in parenting coordination is excellent. We have a segment of that in the book. Uh, it's only the last few years. Most of the parenting coordinators are psychologists, although some are attorneys. And one of the things that's interesting is they write the parenting agreements and they are endowed with uh, judicial author authority. So whereas uh, mediators are not, uh, parenting coordinators are, and if they say, this is the plan, you've agreed to it, they, uh, they have the authority, if one or the other parent violates, to contact the court to enforce the order, which is totally new and wonderful. So that um, they don't need an ombudsman who gets called on Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock the child has a fever and mom won't let the child go to dad's house and then has to go to the pediatrician who already closed the office for permission to go to the other house. So parenting coordination is a new entry into the legal part of the picture. It is not therapy. Okay. Another very important point is that all of the functions 
have to be kept separate. And I just saw this uh, in the newest iteration of the Florida law that one cannot do, and it, it follows our uh, APA code of ethics, you cannot do the treatment, be the custody evaluator, uh, do the expert witness law. These are all separate. The same with the parenting coordinator. It cannot be the therapist for anybody. That can also mean there are a lot of professionals in the picture, but it's much better. Okay. Now, during the legal divorce, you begin to deal with not only the child custody issues, which I have as a, a separate area, and remember we call those visitation, residence, and now child sharing. What happens to the children? Where do they live and when? How much time? And with each couple, if you're working with them, you want to look at what arrangement makes sense for this couple with these children. So if one is in the military, that's going to look like a very different child sharing plan than when both parents live in town near, near each other and can participate in weekly shared parenting. I have found that one week at each house is better than going back and forth every other day, which is disruptive to everybody. But again, that's going to be around a particular couple. To say that the child is with dad on Tuesday night because that's football practice, and then not shift next year when football practice goes to Wednesday night, and to have to go back to court for that is a name. All right, there are easy things they want to be able to do without going back for help. So you want to help them with, to look at writing agreements that make sense and keep them simple. Okay. Um, now, as all of this is going on, one of the things that I think helps children most is children of divorce groups. They're wonderful for kids if they're grouped in about three-year age groups. So five to eight, eight to 11, 11 to 14, 14 to 17. And just to kind of take the tension of them down a little bit, uh, I remember one group that I did where a six-year-old said, last week I went to visit my daddy and I came home and I said to my mother, I had a wonderful time and she started to cry. How could you have a good time with daddy after what he did to us? So the next time I went, I came home and I said, I didn't have any fun. And the third week, he comes back to the group and he says, Mommy wouldn't let me go because she said I wasn't enjoying it. <laughs> okay. And the other kids talked about having had similar experiences. So the leaders of these groups need to know how to intervene. And also I, I suggest whenever anyone is doing children's divorce groups, that they do them with a one-way mirror and that they have parents of other children that age watch because they can't listen to their own children, but they can listen to children of comfortable ages. Just reverse the parents and the children. The parents need to be educated to what this kind of behavior does to the children. Okay. Uh, child therapy, child sibling therapy, so the three or four sibs are together. All right. Now, I don't have time to do very much with the financial settlement, but that's a major issue. And when, who has the children, what amount of time is connected to the money, then there's more of a fight for the money. Um, I'll just again use Florida as an example. When the law was, if the mother had more than 42% of the time, she was entitled to full child support. And it was an amazing to me how many of the um, agreements were negotiated at 45%. Uh, All right, so that 
it wasn't around needs of the children. It was around the child custody support tables, the child uh, support tables. Now that it's dropped to 20 percent uh, and a, a changing figure based on each person's income and percentage of time with the child, they're not fighting for as much time with the children. It's been very interesting to see that change. It's not related to how much you want to be with the children, but where's the money? And, and you sort of sit there and some of it is staggering. Okay. Um, now, so the third stage is the economic. Now, <coughs> please understand, and this is very important, that the legal divorce and the financial or economic divorce are not coterminous. So if the youngest child is two at the time of the divorce and uh, one parent is responsible for paying the other parent child support until the child is 18, the legal divorce is over when the child is two. The financial divorce is not over until the child is 18. So there's still 16 more years of being married financially. And although we prohibit bigamy in our country, we have financial bigamy all the time. We create it legally if a man is supporting his ex-wife through child support, and in some cases through permanent alimony, and he remarries. Everybody with me? Are there any questions on that? I haven't been doing good on taking questions. I feel like I want to wrap up. Okay. Um, anyway, so we have the co-parental divorce, the custody, residence, and child sharing visitation issues. Now, certainly, if one parent is abusive, it needs to be carefully supervised. If they are addicted, all of these things need to be built in. Not all parents are created equal, and many couples, uh, one may not be fit. I think you can understand from who I'm speaking, my primary concern always is about the children. If it's a uh, choice between what the parents want and what the children need, my focus is the children. And I think we need to be clear and state that. Uh, that there will be times where if you think I come out more on the side of the children, and I do. Right. Right. But then I'm not the attorney, so uh, they will come out and who's paying. All right, now, I'm going to get mentioned the school for religious divorce, make sure you take into account how this fits with their belief system because everybody needs a system for meaning and value. How does this fit in? What does it make it feel like for them? And can they reconcile it with their belief system and what they want their children's belief system to be? Now, finally, we get to the post-divorce years. Um, and what's happened in the early post-divorce years is not only the stages that I've talked about, but they have to reconcile where they are in terms of their social community, their workspace, the children with their school and their group, and the extended family. So again, we have more things to juggle out in the wider context. Um, some of the most difficult divorces that I've worked with have been clergy people when they go through a divorce. And I've had uh, Episcopal uh, priests or bishops also. And the congregation may accept that they have a divorce, but then they lose the congregation. <coughs> there are other large corporations that prefer having married men and women. They do not want divorced people to send on the road. They feel married people 
are safer employees. So that becomes part of their larger picture. Where do the children go to school? Is it a school where there are other children of divorce? Or is divorce frowned upon in the school they go to? So all of this also shapes how they feel about themselves. The, um, it's interesting that many uh, people will say, well, when a man is newly divorced, uh, he's accepted back usually into the social scene pretty quickly. Everybody has somebody to fix up with a new bachelor. That depends on his age, it depends on how much money he still has. Uh, there are a number of factors. Uh, many women find it more difficult to get back into circulation. Um, if they're unattractive, it doesn't help. If they're too attractive, their friends may not want them around. <laughs> so um, it, you have to really look at all of this to understand that getting back in circulation is not a breeze for a lot of people. Again, age is a factor. Um, so when you listen, you want to listen to their story with enormous empathy. Um, divorced adult group therapy is good at that time, but not with their own spouse. Again, you want them in different groups. And they tend to derive a lot from hearing each other's experiences and uh, from people somewhat in the same stage of coming out of the divorce process. By the way, um, what I'm talking about is fairly applicable both with uh, gay and straight couples. Uh, I see some of the same kinds of phenomena either way. The loss, the anger, the disappointment, the where do I start again, what happens to the children, uh, whose children are they, if it's a gay couple, what rights do they have under the law, it may be even more complex. Um, the more bitter the divorce, the more difficult for the children. When people like young Kelly said years ago, uh, in surviving the breakup, if the adults do well, the children do. Only if the adults do well and help the children to uh, feel that they can really uh, love both parents, love both sets of grandparents without interference. And if they hear good things about the other parent. By the way, when they don't, when they're critical, it's like if your ex-partner was that horrible, why did you marry them to begin with? All right. The other part of that is, um, if my mother or father was that bad, you're telling me that half of me is no good. How do we build self-esteem in kids if we do that? So, on to end my part of the formal presentation on a happier note. Most people survive divorce. Many go on to good later relationships. Some decide, I shouldn't be married again. I do fine on my own, and my life is rich, and I don't want to be married, and that's a good decision. It's not if it's based on bitterness, and the issue of forgiveness, not everybody can forgive. I think one of the things that's hardest for people to forgive is betrayal and deception. Um, however, they need to forgive themselves, and that's where I work on the forgiveness. For whatever they have done, whatever they've contributed, ultimately they need to work that through so that they can heal and move on and help their children too. But most people do survive and I've seen so many that second and even third marriages are much better. Okay, questions? Yes. In, um, one of the children has an, uh, a disability or illness that will last the Um What are 
Okay. Uh, those are special circumstances that need to be taken into consideration with both the financial arrangement and the living arrangement. Mm -hmm. And I think when they're writing the financial agreement, um, they need to look at that. And although generally I think it's good if the children move back and forth together, because it's good to keep the civil subsystem intact, often one parent is better dealing with the disability. And so one may need to write different uh, child sharing plans depending on what the needs of the child with the disability are and how well each of them can take care of that child. And uh, But I think the financial arrangement has to take that into consideration. Is it typical for it to, that to be written into the financial arrangement? It should be. Absolutely. If it's not written, it didn't happen. All right. Everything is by contract and by agreement. And to try and correct if it's not in there doesn't work. Yes. Uh, typically, if you have a mediator, do you also have uh, lawyers who represent the individual interests of the parties? Um, it seems maybe there's. Uh, a conflict of interest if the mediator tries to have a commitment both to the relationship and to each of the individual parties? Well, in client-centered mediation, uh, you're representing the relationship and doing the best, but it is, it is the parties who are really representing themselves. And we have kind of a profile of what kind of people should mediate. Very hostile, uh, psychotic, not very intelligent, but if they're reasonable people, they mediate well. Now, in states where they require that the lawyers be present in the mediation, as far as one of those, I found as soon as that went into effect that I was ending up mediating the lawyers. They're there to win, they're not there to represent the clients. So I don't find that helpful. They can take the mediated agreement to their attorneys, but generally I like uh, a, a part of the agreement up front that they're mediating, it is their life, they signed the marital agreement, they can sign the mediated divorce agreement, all right? If they need a forensic accountant to do the financials and we have to turn in a full financial disclosure statement. But the lawyer doesn't know what's good for their children. Nobody knows their children as well as they do. They know what they need financially and we use the board and we do his and her assets and the whole thing. The mediator has to be aware of how to do the financials or get an, a, an accounting mediator to come in and help. You can co-mediate. Ken, do you want to add to that? Well, I'm, I'm just surprised that, well, in New Jersey, I'm not doing a lot of divorce mediation, certainly not the financial point, but uh, the, the mantra for, in New Jersey for the parties and their lawyers is that the parties should have an attorney uh, and that the memorandum of agreement that the mediator produces will be then something that they take back to their respective yeah. attorneys. Yeah. If the attorneys have questions or problems, sometimes attorneys have something to contribute right. if they have the collaborative spirit. So it's not bad necessarily for a mediator to have uh, attorney mm -hmm. input. And, it, and, but more particularly, the courts of New Jersey, unless I'm out of touch completely, used to prefer that the parties had legal representation, even though they had a mediated agreement, uh, because the courts feel that uh, that guarantees the stability of the agreement. It's more likely to be an agreement that the court stands behind, but if the parties weren't re represented by legal counsel, there's more opportunity for one or other of the parties to go back to court, and the court will hear. So the courts generally, and mediators too, at least in New Jersey, tend to prefer that the parties are represented by counsel. The two processes are not incompatible, as long as the attorneys are not the Barracuda type that you mentioned, but even there, it's really the, so that if the, if the Barracuda attorney is telling 
uh, the, uh, the client that the mediated agreement is, is full of holes, that raises good questions to discuss in mediation and uh, imp sometimes empowers the client to be a more assertive client with those attorneys. So, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of attorney I, No, I'm sorry. I agree with you. I was talking about our law change where yeah. the attorneys had to be present in the mediation. So the, in, that that shocks me. So in Florida, if if a if, cup, if a couple hires a mediator, they have to bring their the, the mediator the cannot be. Two attorneys oh, have terrible. to be present. What produced that law? Because <laughs> <laughs> that was a very interesting political when, process. When we got mediation to the point in Florida where it was really accepted, um, it became uh, governed by the Florida Supreme Court. And we then were issued certificates of being capable of mediating by the Supreme Court. At that point, the lawyer said, we're jumping into this. And that's what got But does that govern private mediation in Florida? If the, I understand if it's a referral from the court, that's one thing. But if, if parties decide on their own? All, all mediation. All mediation? Yeah. Okay, well. Yeah. For every yes. session, you have to pay your attorney 400 bucks an hour to sit there with you, or is it just once? Uh, no, they're supposed to be present. And that, therefore, many of the mediations would cover four hours. Let's get it done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it became a nightmare. I stopped mediating. I would teach it, but not do it. <laughs> but I just had one thing, folks. So when you and I started this, uh, yeah. doing and studying divorce mediation, uh, it, it was anathema to lawyers. Yeah. Uh, I remember giving talks to legal groups and they would pillory me, literally <laughs> take me apart, you know, limb by limb. And now the entire industry, and that's kind of what it's become, is dominated by lawyers, taught in law schools, and yeah. from what you say, it, psychologists and other mental health professionals have been increasingly moved to the right. sidelines. Fascinating development. That's here. why it's always nice to have another colleague from another <laughs> state because uh, it varies tremendously state by state now. But yes, it's much better, wherever they are, for them to have their own attorneys review it. So just one other follow-up question, because what occurred to me is one of the parties could say, yes, I signed off, I went through the mediation, but I was really browbeaten, I was emotionally upset, I wasn't in a position to really uh, have informed consent on this, and I want to sue this mediator for having, does that sort of thing happen? Um, I, I, I never had it happen, but it depends on the original mediation contract. And mediation is not binding. See, there's binding arbitration. That's a different process. It can be similar, but it's not the same. Yes, please. Do you think that people that come from less binding or belief systems, like just people that are just spiritual or like Buddhist or, um, for instance, just agnostic, do you think that the process is slightly less painful or do you think the pain is I think the pain is still there. See, the, unless you believe um, everything is in the hands of God and I'll turn it over to God, um, that may alleviate or lessen the pain. Uh, but generally, when we're doing therapy, it's taking responsibility for your behavior and not transferring that. So I think you have to look at the intersection between their spiritual beliefs <coughs> and what you know psychologically in terms of responsibility for behavior. Okay. Right. One more question. Um, you mentioned that generally the fact that the uh, are similar for heterosexual and homosexual couples. What are some of the differences that you found working with homosexual couples? Um, I th um, it depends on the support system, system that they have. Uh, if they have a good support system, it's uh, more similar. If they don't, it can feel much more isolated. I think there's also uh, 
some difference if one of the partners has been artificially inseminated rather than if they have adopted. All right. Um, it will also depend on what's on the birth certificate. See, there, there's a difference in the status, perhaps, legally. It's sort of like um, where you have a couple, uh, a heterosexual couple, and it's a second marriage, and the step-parent is very close to the children, and then they divorce. And the step-parent may have no legal rights, and yet be very bonded. And another part of that, with gay or straight, can be um, how punitive either one of them is. Okay. I don't know of much writing, but what I've seen experientially and heard is really that there are more similarities than differences. Okay. Dr. Jones? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. I appreciate it. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>